a journey here at church leading up to Easter. We've been focusing on the story in the Word of God as it takes us closer and closer to this moment, the resurrection. And it's been an incredible uh, discovery, a time of discovery of God on a mission for you and me. God on a mission for our hearts to make all things new in relationship with us. And that's what we've entitled our series that we've been in. And as we said in our announcement video, we're going to keep going after Easter because Easter is a turning point. But we don't want to let the familiar moments, because this story can become familiar sometimes. We don't want to let it become overly familiar. And we don't want to just let it become routine in our lives. We want to keep our hearts prepared. Isn't that right? Like we saw a few weeks ago, we can be like Martha in the story of Martha and Mary, where Jesus says to her, you're so anxious and troubled by many things. Does anybody feel like that sometimes? Like, there's a lot going on in life. It's easy to get anxious and troubled and to focus and fixate on things that are happening. You're anxious and troubled by many things, but Jesus says this, only one thing matters. Only one thing matters, and that's to be with me. He says, Mary has chosen what's better, to sit at my feet and to learn from me. We want to allow the story of Easter to impact us with fresh ears this morning. Amen? So Palm Sunday, last Sunday, we had a look at this crazy fanfare and frenzy that Jesus arrived to Jerusalem in the midst of. It's called the triumphal entry. But how many of you guys know that it was a very different kind of triumph that Jesus had his eyes set on than what they had imagined for him? It was a very different road. He stayed laser focused on his mission to make all things new in our lives. He wasn't just interested in becoming a king of an earthly kingdom because his kingdom is not of this world. And the road that he chose to walk, knowing full well what was to come at the cross, the road that he chose to walk wasn't the one that was lined with palms and shouts of Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The road that he chose to walk for us was the one where he carried our cross. The one where it was insults being thrown at him, not cheers. That's what Jesus did for you and me. He bore our sins at Calvary and fulfilled the old covenant's way of sacrifice. We no longer belong to that old system of earning God's approval and forgiveness with our good deeds by living a perfect life. And I've heard it said, how many of you guys have heard it said, you can either live a perfect life or you can trust in a perfect Savior. So thankful for Jesus. So we get to be people not of that old style of life that Peter calls an empty way of life. We get to be people of a new covenant today because of Jesus, because of the cross. And the world, I think, still operates. Let's be honest, our world still operates under that old mentality sometimes, don't we? No matter who we're interacting with, a lot of times we seem to be starved for affirmation and acceptance. I mean, if we look at the world that we live in and, and just the way we even spend our time nowadays... You know, we live in a world that is super connected to one another, don't we? Like, never before in history, we have unlimited connection to each other. And the more we seemingly have this connection, the more we seemingly have to prove to one another. The more we seemingly compare our lives, our, our real life, and the struggles that we know about us to everybody else's highlight reel. You know? And the stories we put out there on Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. You know, we're looking for acceptance. But nothing can take the place of the approval that we already have in Jesus. Nothing can take the place of the acceptance with the Father as he makes all things new in our lives. No amount of friends or followers, real or digital, can bring peace to our soul like he can. Peter calls the way of living an empty way of life handed down to us. And i got to be honest, I think that that's a status quo. I think there's a lot of people in our world who feel that emptiness. They feel that struggle. They're striving to continually impress people, to get it right, to live a good life. You know, to have the right perception of themselves. But it's left them empty. No matter how much connectedness or information we have, it does not equal transformation in our lives. We have more available to us than ever before, but somehow we are still the most anxious, we're the most troubled, distracted, and medicated generation that's ever walked the face of the earth. That's the world we live in. You know, it's this empty way of life. But Jesus came. But Jesus came for us to show us a different way, a better way. He came to make all things new. In John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. I will lay down my life for the sheep. I came 
Not to steal and kill and destroy like the enemy. I came that you may have life and life more abundantly. Life more abundantly. That life that is only possible in intimate relationship with our creator God. Like Raphael was telling us this morning, he longs for us to draw near. He longs to restore that kind of life to us. So thank God he didn't come to fulfill their dreams for him on that triumphal entry to make him a king of a a common kingdom, the next regime to rise and fall. He had his eyes set on something much, much greater. He came to bring us new life, the kind of life that we were created for. So it's not about him coming to settle all of our little differences, but he came to shatter the stranglehold of death and sin and shame, the constant attempts that we have to live up to his standard, an impossible standard. Aren't you thankful that Jesus came for us? Aren't you thankful today? Is anybody out there thankful? I want to hear you this morning. It's Easter. We can get a little excited in church, can't we? Good. So are you ready to dive back into the story of Easter today? Okay, three, four, five. Are you ready for the word? All right, good. That's better. That's better. Let's pray together. Jesus, we are so thankful for what you've done for us. We're thankful, God, that you didn't just come to help us manage our sin, but you came to give us new life entirely. We're thankful that we get to spend these precious moments in your word. We pray that you would continue to transform us, teach us a new and better way. Holy Spirit, this is your word, and we pray that you would illuminate it in our hearts today, that you would help it to come alive, that every single person who hears the sound of my voice would latch on to even just a thought today of how much you care for them, how much you desire an incredible relationship with them, how different that is, this old way of life that's passing away because the new has come in Jesus. We're so thankful for your love. Let our hearts just rest in peace in that amazing forgiveness and love that you bought for us on the cross. We pray that you would teach us to become your followers in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. So how many of you guys like to read out there? Anybody? Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Laura and I, we like to read. We like to read a lot, actually. We love to read books, whether it's, you know, whatever kind of book, whether it's a spiritual book or a lot of novels. We love novels. Anybody love to read novels out there? What's a good story? You know, it just does something in us. And when we read, we oftentimes will we'll buy two books. I know it's kind of crazy because, you know, we're both reading. But then she can't take it to work and I can't, you know, take it to work and read on our, our spare moments. It's kind of funny, though, because she's been very busy lately. And so I've been able to read ahead in the, in the books that we're reading. And she's terrified. She's terrified that I'm somehow going to let something slip and ruin something for her. You know, I mean, if you, if you like to read, you maybe you can empathize with her. Or maybe you're one of those people who, like, it gets to an intense moment in the story, and you're like, I'm just going to peek ahead a couple pages, just to make sure everything turns out okay. Does anybody anybody do that? All right, Kim. All right. (laughs) Loud and proud. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, there's some people in in the audience just judging you if you raise your hands. Like, that's sacrilege. You can't skip ahead. You don't get to know the ending ahead of time. Right? I love reading. I love reading stories. And you know, the Bible is the greatest story that's ever been told. The Bible is the greatest story we have. It's not a manual, like so many times we try to make it. It's not a manual for managing our sin. It's not a a manual, a self-help book for how we can get better in life. It's not a collection of nice thoughts that we go away and just go, oh yeah, that was a nice thought. It's a love letter from God to you. It is a story, a thousand stories of his goodness in our lives. Over and over and over again. It takes a lifetime to really fully understand how complete and pure this love letter is to you and me. It's a story worth reading. It's an incredible story. But God allows us to skip ahead. It's one of the things we've examined in our All Things New series. You know, from the beginning, right in the beginning in Genesis 3, we catch a glimpse of the victory that Christ came to bring. And all the way at the end in the book of Revelation, we can see the beginning through his eyes. What an incredible thing. Revelation 13, 8 tells us that Jesus has been our sacrifice, the sacrifice for your sin and mine, since the beginning of creation. Since the foundation of the world, he was destined to become that sacrifice for you and me. Since the beginning, when we lost that connection with God. The mission of God to make all things new has been in motion since that time when we lost that connection. Immediately, he went into motion for you and me. Because he can't stand to be apart from us. He didn't create us to live in a world where we're separated from him at all. 
His mission has been underway since the beginning, and Easter is the tipping point of that rescue mission. It's the tipping point. Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11. We're going to read this really quickly. This is Paul's summation of exactly what Christ did for us. And it's an incredible, incredible passage. Philippians 2. Reading in verse 6 to 11, it says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. He became a man for you and me. The story of his coming, the story that we celebrate at Christmas time, it cannot be separated from the purpose for which he came. He came to make all things new. He came to bring redemption for you and me. He's our Emmanuel, God with us. I love that name for God because it's not just who he is, it's his entire purpose of coming. God with us. Intimate relationship restored. It's why he came. Right from the beginning we see it. See, following Jesus, it's not just another world religion like Islam or Buddhism, Scientology. It's not the flavor of the month Another attempt of man to reach an unknowable entity or to become enlightened in some way? It is God intentionally making himself known and drawing us near to himself, drawing us into an abundant life that is more than we could imagine. That is the story that we celebrate at Easter. That although we could do nothing for ourselves, his perfectness, his, his, his perfection comes in our weakness. It's an incredible thing. So there's this moment when Jesus is hanging on the cross, before he breathes his last, and we know that on either side of Jesus were two thieves. And it's incredible. Um, There's two thieves, and they both say something to him. The first one says, you know, if you're the son of God, why don't you just, like, get down off this cross and save yourself? But the second one says, don't you know who you're talking to? And he expresses his faith in Jesus. He expresses his faith that even now, even though Jesus could, that there's something more, and that if he wants to be there, he's there for a reason. Jesus says to that second thief, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise. You know, paradise makes us think a lot of things, doesn't it? I mean, how many of you guys, when you think of paradise, imagine a beach somewhere? Anybody? Like a beach, there's no more worries. My work schedule is clear for three months. That's paradise, right? Anybody like, yeah, it's been winter for way too long. I'm ready for paradise. I'm ready for some Ohio summer. It's supposed to be beautiful. It's April. Come on. Paradise, right? Maybe you might imagine yourself like at a mountain lake home and there's just like the water is just like glass, it's perfectly tranquil, nobody can get to you, right? Your phone drowned in that lake, it's fantastic. Connectedness gone, it's great. But the Bible doesn't define paradise like this. It doesn't define paradise in terms of a place. It doesn't define it in terms of a landscape or a vista that you can look out over physical beauty, or a lack of challenges. The Bible defines paradise in a person. Paradise is our Emmanuel. Paradise is God with us. Today you will be with me in paradise, he said. Like the garden again. With him. The garden wasn't paradise because it had all these amazing trees. The garden was paradise because it was us and God forever. Inseparable. That's what he longs for. That's what paradise looks like. And Jesus made that peace with God, that paradise possible when he died for us on the cross. Aren't you thankful? Oswald Chambers tells us that the cross is the greatest expression of God's nature. He says, it is the gate through which any and every individual can enter into oneness with God. But it is not a gate we pass right through. It is one where we abide in the life that is found there. The reason salvation is so easy to obtain is that it costs God so much. When he humbled himself and became found in appearance as a man, laid down his life on the cross, it cost him everything. But from the very beginning, he chose you and me. And he has never stopped choosing you and me, and he chooses you and me today. 
Sin and shame are no longer able to hold us back from his great love. When God looks at you, he sees a son and a daughter because when he looks at you, he doesn't see all the things you've done wrong. He doesn't see all the times you've missed the mark. He sees his son and what happened on that cross. Amen? So although our own attempts often fall short, you know, the Bible tells us that our righteousness, our own, you know, attempt to earn God's love is like filthy rags. But it also tells us that in him we can become the righteousness of God in Christ because it is finished. Amen? See, he finished everything on the cross, but his mission wasn't over. Let's dive back into the story. I want to look at what happened after he was buried. Let's turn to Luke chapter 24. I want us to read just a few verses together. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12, says this. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back to the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away, wondering to himself, what just happened? He is risen, amen? The tomb is empty today. Revelations 1, 18, in the New Living Translation, tells us this. Jesus speaking to John says, I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. He didn't just break the power of sin over us. He didn't just break the old system and its routine of trying to earn his love. He broke the power of death over us as well. And that's what the resurrection speaks to us of. When he came as a man and lived a sinless life, he did the impossible. When he died and rose again, he rose to a new kind of life that we didn't even know was possible. He is alive forevermore. This eternal life was something that was only dreamed of. But he came to make that the norm in our lives. He came to reestablish the possibility of life with him. A life more abundant. Everything hinges on this moment, on the resurrection. You know, it is the cornerstone of our faith. It's the cornerstone of everything that we believe and the resurrection is God's stamp of approval on the finished work of Christ. It's the proof that he was more than just a prophet from Nazareth, as they announced him. That he was more than just a coming conqueror or a military hero could ever be. It's the proof that he was the son of God. Death could not hold him because he was the pure, spotless lamb. He's sinless and perfect in every way. And death had no hold on him, and today it has no hold on us. In him was a completely new kind of life. And John tells us that life is the light of men. It's the light by which we can see everything. Jesus rising and appearing to over 500 people before ascending into heaven makes all things new in our lives. And encountering the risen Christ turned a scared, you know, disillusioned group of followers who were worried about what would happen to them because they followed him. It turned them into the greatest transformational team that the world has ever seen. And just think about how many churches are meeting today in Cleveland area alone that came from just a handful of followers who were terrified that day. The resurrection invites us into a new life. As his blood covers our sin and shame and makes us people of a new covenant, his resurrection empowers us to be people of new futures in him. No matter what has gone before, there is a new future for you in Christ. Romans 8 tells us that there is now no more condemnation or shame for us who've been chosen to be his. On the contrary, not a single thing in heaven 
or on earth or below the earth. No angels, nor demons, no powers or principalities. Nothing can separate you from his great love. Nothing at all because of what the resurrection means for you and me. I love that this story, Luke, fills us in on the character of Peter. How many of you guys love Peter in the Bible? You know, Peter was the guy who got it wrong a lot. He was the guy who was constantly sticking his foot in his mouth. And he was also, at this moment, he was the most ashamed of all of them. You know, he was terrified of what exactly was about to go down. Because his last actions, have any of you guys ever, like, said some things to your children or maybe your family before walking out the door and then you're like, terrified that something's going to happen that day and you're never going to get to apologize to them. That's where Peter was. He was the most ashamed because before Jesus died, the last thing that he did wasn't to tell him how much he loved him, wasn't to reaffirm what he had said to him so many times before, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The last thing Peter did was to deny him three times. Jesus saw it happening. Jesus looked up at him and Peter felt that anguish of the soul of what it looks like to, to not stand up for what you believe in And he was so ashamed. He was so ashamed. His last actions were to deny him three times. But when the women return from the tomb and they tell their story, which sounds like nonsense, he's he's alive again. He's risen. There's this glimmer of hope. And what does Peter do? He takes off running. He takes off running to see the risen king. Peter is a picture of the followers of God. And let's be honest, so many times he's a picture of you and me. You know, we've gotten it wrong a whole lot. But he goes from being a scared and ashamed young man who constantly said dumb things and got it wrong all the time to speaking boldly before crowds of thousands with supernatural wisdom and understanding of the Scripture that there's zero chance that he had enough lifetime to even absorb because of the power of the Holy Spirit working in him. What happened that made this change happen? His fears and shame were completely shattered in the presence of the risen Jesus. They were completely shattered. Isaiah 43, the Lord tells us this. Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Can you see it happening in your midst? That's what the Lord calls us to see. And i got to tell you today, it's okay to let go. It's okay to let go of the past. It's okay to leave some things behind. For each and every person that is here today, I want you to know that the message of the resurrection, the call of all scripture is simply this. No matter what has happened to you in your life, no matter what you've done, no matter how many times you feel you've fallen short, you haven't lived up to expectations you even have for yourself, sometimes we can be our our harshest critics. Isn't that right? We know we can do better, but we get it wrong sometimes. Go and read Romans 7. Paul, the greatest apostle, He has this great battle saying, I don't do what I want to do. I know I can do better, but I just I can't seem to do it. So if you're here and you're saying, I I have fallen short so many times, I want you to know you're in very, very good company, not just in this room, but also in this word as well. There are so many, but Scripture constantly says, no matter how many times you have fallen short, and each and every one of us has done that more times than we can count, there are no perfect people here, you're still invited. You're invited to life with him as he makes all things new in your life. You're invited. You belong in his presence. That's where fullness of joy, peace can be found. So like Peter, the resurrection speaks to us of second, third, tenth, 490th chances. We all get it wrong, but there is no limit to God's love. There is no condemnation, and there's nothing that can separate us from his love. So we can let go of our failures and dare to believe Dare to move forward in Christ. Amen? Amen. What does the resurrection mean for us? I just want to give you a couple of, couple of thoughts on what the resurrection has done and accomplished for us. First and foremost, it means the promises of God are ours. They're our inheritance. 2 Corinthians 1.20 is one of the most important verses in all the New Testament. It says this, No matter how many promises God has made in the entirety of this word, In Christ, because of what he did on the cross, they are yes for us. God has given the approval of those promises. They're outworking in our lives because of what Christ has done. We can claim all the promises in the word of God to be true over our lives because of what Christ has done in raising from the dead. That's what the resurrection means for us. The promises of God are ours. The freedom of God is ours. 
Romans 6, verses 6 through 8 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body that was ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anybody who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we shall also live with him. There is freedom for us in Jesus because of the resurrection today. It's not just the promises, but it's also his freedom. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer slaves to that shame. Every single one of us has a past, and we can leave it behind and move forward in freedom because of the resurrection. We have freedom in Christ. Also, the presence of God is ours. His presence is our peace. Like we looked at on Good Friday, the separation between a holy God and us sinful people who get it wrong all the time was shattered when he breathed his last and completed his sacrifice. At the very end of Matthew's gospel, the Great Commission, he sends forth his followers. But what does he say to them? The very last thing that Matthew captures, he says, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. I'm with you always, Emmanuel, God with us. That's why he came. The psalmist exclaims to the Lord, you will fill me with joy in your presence. His presence is our inheritance. It's constant. He is always with us. In our moment of need, in our moment of confusion, we can call to him. And he's right there, waiting, waiting, waiting to bring peace into our lives. It's that joy of life together. That joy of us being found in his presence again. The Hebrews tells us is the reason he endured the cross. Because he could see through that painful day. He could see through even today to a time when there is no separation between us and him. That's why he went to the cross. And finally, the resurrection speaks to us of the power of God being ours as well. The power of God. Romans 8 tells us this. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you and me. It lives in us. That power which raised him, brought him back to life, raised him to a new life where death has no hold on him where sin and shame, shame are broken, that is the power that we can walk in because of the resurrection. Amen? Amen. So today, I want us to recognize just how important the resurrection is. His cross means unconditional forgiveness and grace, and the empty tomb means new life with him forevermore. All things new in Jesus. So today, I want you to know that every single day that you walk this earth can be Easter. Every single day is meant to be Easter in your life. Every single day he is risen. Every single day you can walk in his freedom. You can walk in his promises. You can walk in his power. You can walk in his presence. Every single day because of the resurrection. Today we are people of a new future. Can we celebrate what Jesus did for us? Can we celebrate today what he did for us? Can we remember today? Isaiah 25 verse 8 tells us that the old way of death, the old way of trying to earn our way to, get to God's favor, he has swallowed it up forever. That's what Isaiah tells us. Mission accomplished. It is finished today. Amen? Our world doesn't need more information. We don't need more computers. We don't need more encyclopedias. We don't need more information. We need truth. The truth of the resurrection. We need the truth that we can walk in freedom. That we don't have to be bound anymore in our sin, in our shame, in our past, in our hurts, in what people have done to us, and what people said about us, there's not a single thing that we need to be bound by because of the resurrection today. He swallowed it up forever. We can live in that freedom that he came to bring us. And he is still our Emmanuel today. He's still God with us. He still wants to make all things new in his presence. Would you just close your eyes with me for just a moment? We're going to reflect on what the resurrection means for us. See, our prayer from the beginning of this journey has been for you. Our prayer from the beginning of looking at Easter again, the incredible love of God for us, has been that we would hear this story, the amazing story of Easter, with fresh ears today. Some of you guys have never heard this before. And I don't know if you're here and you've, you've heard it a million times or if you've never heard of God's incredible love before. I don't know if somebody dragged you here today and you're just along for the ride and you didn't know what you were getting into. But I don't want us to leave this place without giving every one of us an opportunity to consider what the resurrection means for us. That every day can be Easter. I don't want us to leave this place without an opportunity to respond to the invitation that God is constantly making, constantly making to you and I to make all things new in our lives. 
a life more abundantly with him. Maybe you're here today and you feel a little bit like Peter. You're all too aware of the ways you've fallen short. You're all too aware that even though you, you know what you want your life to look like, you can't seem to get there. You can't seem to shake some of the things that have been holding you down. You feel like you've got a ball and chain tied to your feet. Maybe you're like Peter today. You know what Jesus would say to you? Jesus would say, forget the past. Don't dwell on the former things. I have a new future for you today. You can be a person with a new future today. You can be restored today. You can come into life with me like never before. Maybe you feel like that thief on the cross. You know, all the problems that you've created have put you in a place that you, you can't seem to get out of. Maybe today you need to hear what Jesus says to him again. Today you can be with me in paradise. Today I can come into your life and accompany you into all of your situations, into your waking and sleeping, into your workplace, into the trouble that you have. I can be right there. I am right there. All you have to do is respond and say, I want you there with me. 2 Corinthians 6 tells us that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that salvation has come. Today can be the beginning of God making all things new in your life. The Bible tells us it's really simple. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him for the dead, believe in that resurrection power, we can be saved from all the, the bondage that we find ourselves in. We can be saved from all the past that we have you know, maybe want to leave behind. It's that simple. But like Oswald Chambers said, it's only that simple because it cost him everything. It's that simple. It cost him everything. So if you're here today and you want to step into new life with him, whether it's for the first time or for the millionth time, we're going to pray in just a moment. But with everyone's eyes closed, would you just look up at me and make eye contact for just a second? Maybe you're here today and you just want to start something new. You know, we're not going to put you on the spot. We're not going to make you do anything weird. But would you just look up at me and make eye contact? Yeah, there are eyes all over the place. Thank you, Jesus. All things can be new in your life today. It's an incredible thing. Maybe you're here and you've surrendered to God before. You've, you've heard this message before and it's taken root in your life. But, you know, like, like the, the Gospel of Mark records for us, sometimes that, that truth, that promise sinks in and it's like a seed planted in our lives. But sometimes our soil, the soil of our hearts has these thorns that grow up around that seed. The cares of this world the immediacy of all the urgent things like Martha, you're distracted, you're anxious, you're troubled by so many things. Our daily schedules are nuts. And maybe you've made that commitment to God before. Maybe you've said, you know, God, I want to walk with you, but things have gotten in the way. Those challenges have come back. That addiction you're battling, it's still there. Maybe you just want to say, God, again today, I just want to, I want to make all things new. I want you to come and do a new thing in my life. I want you to help me forget the former things and to move forward into a new future with you. If you want to take that step as well, if you want to just invite God and say, I want a fresh start today, would you just look up at me as well? Yeah. Again, there are eyes everywhere. Amen. Amen. There's nothing that he desires more than life with us. It's why he came. It's the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross to bring us. I want to invite us to do something as we close our service today. Would you just stand with me? Just all over this, this sanctuary. Would you just stand to your feet? You know, we're a church family, and so we're not afraid to do some family-style things. Every once in a while, we like to do this. Would you just grab the hand of your neighbor? And maybe if you're here and there's nobody next to you, you can reach across the aisle. You can reach, you know, to the row in front of you. Just hold somebody's hand in this moment. This is a family moment. This is a faith-filled moment. There are so many people who, who locked eyes with me to say, God, I want you to make all things new in my life. And the beauty of the resurrection is that we can have that. We can move in his power. We can experience his freedom and his presence today. And we can claim that the promises of God to make all things new in our lives will come to pass. Do you believe it? Amen, amen. Well, if you want to pray this with me, we're just going to simply extend our faith together. Just repeat this after me. Just say, dear Jesus, I thank you that you are making all things new. Today, I let go. Today, I leave the past behind to move forward with you. 
Would you forgive my sins and cleanse my heart? I thank you for coming with me. I thank you for dying on the cross and for being raised to new life, an eternal life, with new life for me as well. Today I choose you. My life is yours. Make me a new creation and teach me to follow you. I love you. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Can we give God a round of applause?